Good evening. Welcome to the UST Museum of Natural Science. My name is Dirk van Turenhout. I am the curator of anthropology. I am not Amy Potts. <laughs> I'm sure you saw that. Amy sends her regards and regrets. She's at home with laryngitis. Little boy Reese came home from school. And somehow these bugs transfer. Now, mom is sick and he's fine. Thank you very much. That's the way it always works. Anyway, thank you all for being here tonight. I would like to thank the Leakey Foundation for their very long lasting tradition of coming here. We really enjoy having speakers come to us, talk to us about human evolution. And I know tonight will be another excellent lecture. I also would like to point out that after this presentation, there will be an opportunity to buy and have signed a copy of Dr. Angham's latest book. This will be upstairs, back in the gift shop, right in the shadow of our Allosaurus replica. And what I would like to do also at the end of the presentation is come back up here and with the speaker's permission, perhaps there might be some time for Q and A's. So I'll do my best to uh, identify people and try to reiterate the questions so that everybody hears what was asked, but the answers will come from you, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> so. The last thing I need to do right now is to introduce Diane McSherry, who is a native Houstonian and a member of the Leakey Foundation, and she will introduce our speaker. Thank you very much, Diane McSherry. Thank you, Jim. Hello, uh, I'm Diana McSherry, Vice President of the Leakey Foundation, and I'm delighted to welcome you to an intriguing presentation on how cooking drove human evolution. Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. Tonight's speaker, Dr. Rangam, might say, I cook, therefore I think. Or even, I cook, therefore I am, since he posits that it is cooking that made us human. This talk represents almost a decade of joint events uh, hosted by the Houston Museum of Natural Science, uh, sponsored by Wells Fargo, and with speakers provided by the Leakey Foundation. The Leakey Foundation sponsors human origins research aimed at answering questions such as, where did we come from? Why are we the way we are? And it is the only US foundation devoted exclusively to human origins research. So we welcome all of you who would be interested in joining this grand uh, adventure of discovery. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Richard Rangham renowned primatologist from Harvard University and co-director of the Kabali Chimpanzee Project in Uganda. Dr. Rangam was a former co-chair of the Leakey Foundation Scientific Executive Committee, helped launch the Diane Fossey Gorilla Foundation, and is currently a trustee of the Jane Goodall Institute. Author of an astonishing number of papers and, and books, Dr. Rangam's theme tonight will be based on his most recent book, Catching Fire, how cooking made us human. And as Dirk said, he'll be available for signing books upstairs afterwards. Leading into the talk is a short video, What Makes Us Human, featuring Dr. Rangam and other stars of the human origin world. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Rangam. OK, my first job is as a technical expert, which is a bit of a stretch. But let's see if we can get this um, movie working. Questions out there about the very 
uh, good mothers and bad mothers in chimp society as in human society, the experience of the child during those early one or two years is really significant in shaping their adult behavior. The chimpanzees have forced people to realize that we are not the only beings on the planet with personalities, minds, and feelings. The picture of human evolution was really quite simple. He went from Australopithecus to Homo erectus to archaic people to modern people. And it was simple, uh, but in retrospect, it was uh, a simplicity born of ignorance. The last 30 years has seen an explosion of new finds, new species, new genera of fossil hominids. There have been many experiments in human evolution. Most of them ended up in extinction. We're the only one. things that starts happening when you're a smart, sophisticated primate is you can start getting worried about things that are not for real. You're a normal mammal, somebody is intent on eating you, and you turn on the stress response thing, and what that stress response is designed to do is save your life in the next three minutes. But it's not until you get to us that you can do stuff like turn on the exact same stress response, not because you're getting attacked by some rival, suddenly you're smart enough to realize you're going to die someday or something incredibly stressful happened in the novel you were reading about some imaginary character it didn't evolve for that look at some diseases of humans who don't deal with psychological stress very well these are some of the leading psychiatric disorders marathons are not a fluke they're actually part of our biology humans are phenomenal long-distance runners. We're dreadful sprinters, but we're better than any other mammal at running really long distances. Well, why did humans start running? I believe it's because of hunting. For millions of years, humans ran barefoot. And only since the 1970s did people start running wearing running shoes. And it turns out that barefoot runners actually perform better and injure themselves less. It's evolution that matters in terms of understanding how the human body works. Chimpanzees living in groups with their relatives search for individuals in neighboring groups, particularly the males, and kill them. There are only two animals on Earth that do this, humans and chimpanzees. What does it mean that it is ourselves and our closest relatives that show these patterns that many of us think as cultural, which is the pattern of war? think around these problems, to develop ways of discounting the parts of our own mind that, that get in the way of greater cooperation, greater wisdom. As we look ahead to the enormous challenges of the future, whether they're to do with climate change or outcoming diseases or the way that people behave in the future, then we need to understand the way that life at every level, and the way life works is through evolution. There are three crucial sources of information about who we are as a species and how we came to be that way. Studies of primates in the wild, studies of hunter-gatherer peoples, studies of human fossils. All of them are delicate, endangered research operations. None of them is being fully funded by the federal government. In this business, there's a lot happening very quickly. Land's becoming unavailable. Dams are being built up that may flood important paleontological areas. Populations of primates are going extinct. Um, it's critical to get as much work done as soon as possible. We don't question whether public money goes to support libraries or uh, concerts, uh, music, uh, literature, uh, art. We, we don't argue about that. Those are all very profound things that uh, that nourish the human soul. So does science, and especially
especially human evolution. Whenever you turn to the New York Times and you see some kind of a science article, some kind of great discovery from some scientist in some remote part of the world, you can absolutely be assured that that scientist either was funded in that research by the Leakey Foundation or had his career launched by the Leakey Foundation when no one else would fund them, when everybody thought the idea was too risky. And like venture capital, the greatest rewards come from taking the greatest risk. The Leakey Foundation is spectacular because they are providing the foundations of how we have to think about every aspect of our biology and our health and our well-being and all the good stuff. And they're one of the only ones doing it. Without Louis Leakey fighting to get that first money for me to go in 1960, there would be no James W. the Gombe chimpanzees. How big an exciting story is it to know where we as a species come from? What we are doing here on this earth? What turned us from an ape into a human? These are things that give meaning to our presence. And it's still a developing story. Okay, I finished my technical expertise bit, and now I can talk. It's a thrill to be here. Uh, I'd like to thank the, the Houston Museum, uh, one of the, the best museums in the United States, I believe, and I can see it from my short time here. And what you heard about with the Leakey Foundation in that video certainly applies to my own career and the career of many of the people that I work with. It's just been a huge privilege to be supported by them at all sorts of levels. I've now 25 years into my current study of chimpanzees in Western Uganda, and several times during that period, the Leakey Foundation has come through critically to enable us to keep going when funds were hard to find. During that time, I developed all sorts of interests, very much concordant with the exciting aim that the Foundation has of understanding where humans come from, why we are the way we are today, and what we're going to be like in the future. And for me, one of the most exciting things has been thinking about the origin of humans from the point of view of diet. When we think about most animals, the diet is fantastically important in understanding where they come from. If you want to understand what a flea does and why it's shaped the way it is, then you have to understand that it's adapted to eating blood, and dolphins for eating fish, and giraffes for eating leaves off the tops of trees. And many people have been thinking about the evolution of human diet for many years, and the general kind of answer to what makes us special is, well, we're very good at eating all sorts of lots of different things. But a few years ago, it occurred to me that we are particularly good at eating things that we process ourselves. The raw meat that you can see here in the foreground is much less attractive than the cooked meat that's going on in the background. I was visiting with these Hadza hunter-gatherers of northern Tanzania, really the last practicing hunters and gatherers in Africa, so therefore representing this astonishingly important but very rapidly disappearing thread to our past. And it's wonderful to see how consistent their behavior is with hunters and gatherers around the world. They have their own particular systems, of course, but um, as in many places, the men are collecting meat and the women are collecting roots, and here they are cooking them. And it's hard to imagine that they would be able to survive very well without cooking. I asked the Hadza, please, can we do an experiment? I'd like you to just go without cooking your food for just a few days. They laughed and laughed and laughed. It's ridiculous. And one of the most important 
foods for hunters and gatherers in Africa is honey, sometimes judged to be a preferred food to meat. And it's very difficult to imagine how they would eat a lot of honey unless they had fire to control the bees by gentling them down when you put smoke into the beehive. But as it is, they can sometimes rely on honey for several months of the year as their favorite food. Now, for those sorts of reasons, it's not that surprising that when Darwin considered the question of some of the really important factors affecting humans, he had this famous quotation, that man has discovered the art of making fire by which hard and stringy roots can be rendered digestible and poisonous roots or herbs innocuous. He said, this discovery of fire, probably the greatest ever made by man, excepting language, dates from before the dawn of history. So Darwin, of course, was uh, the founder of modern evolutionary biology. And what happened to this idea? And the answer is, pretty much absolutely nothing until very recently. People have paid very little attention to the possible significance of the control of fire. And I think the reason is this, that when he said this, he said the discovery of fire probably the greatest ever made by man. Now the point about that is this, that as long as humans have been recognizably what Darwin is calling man, then we have been fairly consistent in our biology. So consistent that if the discovery of fire was made by one of the beings that we would classify as humans, then fire didn't do very much because we were so stable evolutionarily after that. So I think that is part of the reason for the conventional wisdom represented here. One of those australopithecines that we have seen in the slides and video up to around two and a half million years ago, eventually giving way to a form of being, Homo erectus, that is so similar to modern humans that they could walk into a store and dress themselves from a store on Main Street, unlike any previous being. And then there was a little bit of thinning, a little bit of less robustness, until we finally end up with the perfection of Homo sapiens represented by the president of Harvard. <laughs> now, if fire came in during the period that we were already human, then it didn't have that much effect. It maybe just made us a little bit more gracile, but our brains were getting big regardless. There wasn't any sudden increase in brain size. Nothing else happened to be really significant. Part of the reason that people have adopted this view that fire came in relatively late is because of the archaeological evidence. So if you look at the archaeological evidence of the use of fire, then it's helpful to do so with this diagram, which represents human evolution, starting back at 1.9 million years ago with the origin of Homo erectus. And Homo erectus spreading, staying in Africa and going into Europe and going into Asia, and then becoming Heidelbergensis and Neanderthals, and then eventually becoming Sapiens relatively recently. And if you look at the little icons for the representation of fire, you see that they start thinning out before about 200,000 years ago. There are some pretty confident representations of fire at 400,000 years ago. There's one at 790,000 years ago in Israel. There's actually one that's about to be published uh, in South Africa, Wunderwerk. But the whole picture gets a bit shaky the older you go back in human evolution. So that is why people tend to think that fire has not been particularly important. And in addition, there is this remarkable observation that until very recently, people have thought that cooking was something arbitrary. The great social anthropologist, Claude Lévi-Strauss, in writing his book, The Raw and the Cooked, in the 1960s, he said, people do not have to cook their food. They cook for symbolic reasons. The reasons were to establish a kind of psychological wall between ourselves and other animals. Well, what one particular individual thinks may not be so important. But what strikes me as really dramatic 
is that nobody challenged that. Nobody said, now wait a minute, are you sure that humans are perfectly capable of doing like other animals and living off raw food? So the idea was that, well, humans are animals and animals eat their food raw, so humans should be able to eat their food raw. And in line with that, you probably know yourselves, many people who have at various times adopted a raw food diet that I'll talk about in a minute. But for me, I think um, the uh, interest in food goes back to my earliest days of working with Jane Goodall, studying chimpanzees in Gombe National Park, and particularly, actually, studying feeding behavior. So during uh, my first year there, I documented everything that chimpanzees ate, and I decided that I wanted to really get under the skin of the chimps, so I ate everything that they ate with uh, the exception of a, a few rather gross bodily secretions. <laughs> Here you've got a wonderful photograph by Ronan Donovan um, up in one of our trees in, in Kaniwara in, uh, in western Uganda. And you've got a dozen or more chimps here uh, eating the figs. And of course, it's true that many of the foods occur very high up, but some of them occur relatively close to the ground. And very often these figs do fall, so it's possible to eat them. But the short story here is that it's very difficult to fill your belly with any of the fruits that the chimpanzees eat. They are just too nasty tasting. And one of the ways in which I justify that claim is that a year or two later, I spent nine months uh, living my honeymoon year with my wife Elizabeth in eastern Congo, studying pygmies and the farmers that they lived with and talking to the pygmies about the foods in the forest. And I knew what the chimpanzees were eating, and uh, they said that even during the periods of starvation, when there, were, uh, there was uh, insurrections in the Congo, they would not be able to eat surviving on the chimpanzee foods. Of course, the chimpanzees eat other things as well. They eat raw meat. Uh, of course, they're eating uh, monkeys. I, I've tried these. Uh, they are uh, just like other raw meat on the whole, but there's very little fat on them. From the measurements we've taken, it's about 3 to 4% fat, entirely inadequate compared to the good 25% fat on a Texas steak. There's honey. There's uh, quite a lot of hives in the forest, but the chimps have a lot of respect for the bees. You can get a 1,000 African honey bees attacking a chimp when it gets into a hive, and uh, they only typically last, the chimpanzees, about three or four minutes before they, they run from um, getting the honey. And by the way, the observers do too. When we see the chimps getting honey, then we know that the bees are going to come and attack us, and we're normally out of there very quickly. And then when they can't find their fruits and meat and honey, then the chimps are resorting to things like leaves and pith, which you definitely cannot eat a lot of. So what never happened was this. We just never found chimpanzees making kebabs in the forest. Uh, David Bygart here has, has fantasized uh, from a photograph of his uh, in which the chimpanzees were holding these little sticks and they were putting them into a nest of uh, ants, of army ants. And then they allow the army ants to crawl up the stem, and then they wipe them off the stem in a quick movement and pop them into their mouths and chew them quickly, because otherwise the ants bite ferociously. This is what I really wanted. So I would spend my days sometimes deliberately seeing if I could survive off those chimp foods and finding, frankly, that it was no good at all. And I waited until I got back in the evening and had my bowl of mashed potato or spaghetti or something other than the wild fruits of the forest. So I was a bright young thing, and it only took me about 20 years to think of the significance of this uh, observation, that cooked food was somehow nicer to eat than the raw foods there. And then I had a sort of uh, uh, epiphany and thought, this you know, should be pretty significant. So together with some colleagues, I wrote a paper saying, surely cooked food is going to be very important in human evolution because it would provide lots more energy, thinking of my experience of trying to survive on raw food. And in the responses to that original paper written in 1999, some of them said, wait a minute, 
What do you mean? Cooked food gets more energy than raw food. That's not true at all. And it's only in the last, what, 13 years that um, many of us at Harvard have been working on this problem and I think have now convincingly shown that actually you get more food out of food when it's, more calories out of food when it's cooked than when it's raw. However, this is not the way that people necessarily see it. So here are uh, a raw sausage and a cooked sausage. And the question I want to ask you in your mind is, which do you think has more calories? And if you look up on the USDA nutrient database, which is the gold standard for the source compiling all the best studies on how many calories there are in our food, then here is the answer that you get. Slightly more when it's raw. And the reason that people say it's slightly more is that when you cook, there are some dripping losses. And so out of the dripping, when you cook your sausage, go some fats and proteins that mean that there's slightly fewer calories left there. And more generally, if you look at the studies in the USDA nutrient database that have taken the same foods and looked at them cooked and raw by the same lab, then here is the kind of thing that you find. The energy density, the calories per 100 grams when eaten raw, and the energy density when eaten cooked follow along a straight line. So what we are being told by the national data source is that you get the same amount of calories out of raw food as you do out of cooked. Well, I don't think that's right, and I want to begin this talk by first of all examining that proposition about the notion that cooking affects the amount of energy that we get out of the food. And then I'll go out and think about some of the evolutionary aspects. This is a baboon lying on a fire, uh, about to be eaten by the Hadza. Well, let's start with this. If you go to the web and start poking around with um, people who are talking about raw foodism, the practice of eating all your food raw, then you find lots of people, like this young woman, who put up their photographs to show what happens to them when they go on a raw food diet. They lose weight. So if there's one message from this lecture, here is a great way to lose weight. Just eat your food raw. Now what is striking about this is that this is true even though the food is in many ways very high quality and it is processed. So even raw foodists process their food, they, they blend it, they grind it, they put it in all sorts of electrical machines that were not available to our ancestors, and uh, they even dry it at temperatures that many people would think of as cooking, uh, up to about 115 degrees Fahrenheit. This food is very high quality because it's been domesticated, so it's oranges and apples and bananas rather than the tough, fibrous, nasty tasting foods that you get if you go out into the woods. The people are often eating meat. Some raw foodists don't eat meat, some do. And if it, you look at the effect of meat on the body weight, uh, you don't see any statistical significance. It's not just the fact that some raw foodists are vegetarians that affects their relatively low body weight. They're eating oil, it, they're taking food from a global food resource, they're having no seasonal loss of food quality because they can get food from South Africa or Israel or Brazil or wherever it is during the periods when we have no growing food here. And in addition, they're working a lot less hard on average than the hunters and gatherers. Now, I don't think there's anything special about humans in these respects. In fact, um, uh, nowadays, it's recently been shown that our pets are suffering from the same kinds of problems of weight control as, uh, as we do. Um, in fact, it's not just our pets, uh, it's our cats and our dogs, and it's all the animals are associated with us. It's um, uh, rats, urban rats are getting fatter because they're eating, I think, cooked food provided by us. Um, so are animals in laboratories. And so, rather tragically, are, uh, are hedgehogs. I don't know if you can see 
In, in Britain, there are quite a few hedgehogs, although they've gone down enormously in number in the last decade or more. And, um, and people like hedgehogs, and they, they like to, uh, to look after them and so on. Of course, they're wild animals. Um, they can protect themselves uh, against the, the predators uh, by rolling up and, and exposing only their prickles. So they're doing pretty well uh, uh, if they're not interfered with in other ways. But people take pity on them when they're looking for food, and they put out bits of bread and milk and so on. And, uh, and the result is that the hedgehogs put on weight. And they get so fat that they can't roll up. <laughs> so then they get taken by the foxes. And so then once people realize this, and they said, OK, well, we've got to have a weight control program for the hedgehogs. <laughs> so then there was a system of um, bringing them into the homes and uh, filling the bath with enough water to uh, enable the hedgehogs to go on swimming exercises. So I don't think there's anything particularly odd about humans. <laughs> Cooked food, if you look at all sorts of different cases in which uh, animals, wild and domestic, have had access to it, um, it uh, increases the uh, body weight. And I think we have uh, some reasonable explanations for why, and I'm going to point to, to three in particular. First of all, we have known for a long time that starch, which is the most important single molecule for our food supply, uh, estimated to uh, provide about 60% of the world's food, these little starch grains that are, are um, in uh, plants are very indigestible if they are not gelatinized. And gelatinization is the process, essentially, of the starch granule opening up and allowing the molecules of amylose and amylopectin inside, chains of glucose, to be able to become exposed to the digestive enzymes. Well, you can see here the physical process and the consequences are represented in a graph here where what we see is that if you feed people with various kinds of uh, starch or glucose, you can measure the glucose in the blood subsequently. And if you feed glucose, you get a certain rise. If you feed cooked cornstarch, you get a certain rise very similar to the glucose. But if you feed raw cornstarch, the rise is much lower. So this is a low glycemic food, and indicated here by the way in which this is declining is that the total area under the curve, in other words, the total number of calories, is much less if you eat your starch raw. That's quite a well-known area, so I'm not going to go into it in any more detail than that. But much less well-known is protein. Now, I've got a photograph of uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger here because, as a bodybuilder, he's a member of a group of people who, for years, have said that the way to build up your muscle is to eat your protein raw, in the form of raw eggs. And Vince Gironda, who was his uh, mentor, he recommended eating 36 raw eggs a day. This uh, is uh, justified, I suppose, by the fact that Chicken eggs are a very high quality form of protein. It's got the right amino acid balance and uh, very high biological values in the sense that um, they support growth in rats uh, very well indeed. And it looks very highly digestible. But the reason that people think it's digestible is going to require a little detour into thinking about the process of digestion. When we published our paper saying it looks as though cooking increases the number of calories we get from food, people said, but wait a minute. If you look at food after it has been digested by people, in other words, in the feces, you don't find the proteins and the starches that went in when you ate the food, and therefore it must have been digested. And therefore, raw food, if it's been totally digested, must provide just the calories that cooked food does too. But here's the problem. The problem is that when you look at a, an organism like me or this guy here, what you're really thinking about in digestive terms is two things. One is the me you can see, and the other is the 500 or more species of bacteria that occupy our large intestine. Because they are, to some extent, competing for our food. If food passes undigested through the stomach, through the small intestine, and into the large intestine, then 
it is going to be digested or fermented by the bacteria and the products of those bacterial fermentation may or may not be used by our bodies. And in the case of protein, the estimate for how much of the protein that is digested by the bacteria is available for us to use is 0%. So in other words, if it gets through undigested to the large intestine, it's no good to us, even if we don't excrete any in our feces. Now the way to study this problem, therefore, is with an experiment in which you can use somebody who's had the misfortune of, for medical reasons, losing their large intestine. And that means that the small intestine is brought to the surface of the abdomen and it is uh, entered into a little bag, a stoma. So these are ileostomy patients and a researcher can then come along and take out the contents of that bag and see the extent to which food has been digested. And here is the only experiment done with protein. People were fed either raw eggs or scrambled eggs, of course, without any margarine or butter or fat or whatever. And with the ileostomy patients, a small number, what they found was that they were able to look at the protein that came through at the end of the small intestine. And when it was cooked, 91% of the protein had gone. But when it was raw, only 51%. So about half of it still remained. And that was going to go into the large intestine where it would be no good to us in terms of calories. And uh, they were able to do this by marking the food with stable isotopes and then monitoring the stable isotope production in the breath. And then they were able to use healthy volunteers to be a comparison. And they got somewhat similar results up to 65% of the raw eggs being digested then. And there's an easy explanation for why this is, because protein, until it is cooked, is relatively resistant to digestion. But when it is heated up, then the structure is opened up, and the amino acid chains are available to be much more easily accessed by the digestive enzymes. So it makes every sense that cooking will increase the ability of the body to digest the food. There's a third way as well. And this, I think, is totally fascinating because, in some ways, it's rather surprising. It is the extent to which you soften the food. Now, softening the food is, in many ways, the aim of the, the good cook. If you think about the food you eat on feast days, it tends to be just incredibly soft. It all will melt in your mouth. And in the experiment I'm going to describe, the food wasn't cooked differently, but the only thing that was looked at was the extent to which the food was soft. The experiment consisted of taking two groups of rats and feeding them two versions of the standard laboratory chow, the ordinary version and then a version that was softened. And the way they softened it was simply adding air. It was like taking a grain of wheat and making it puffed wheat, except without cooking it at all. So this was regular chow and puffed chow. Same weight of pellets, same number of measured calories per pellet, same water content, same everything except more air in one lot. And they were able to show that the rats had the same food intake, the same calorie intake, the same water intake, and they monitored their locomotion. So by standard theory, they would be ending up exactly the same. And here's what happened. The ones eating the hard diet grew at a lower rate than the ones eating the soft diet. And so in the cartoon version, you see them ending up thinner. They were significantly thinner before they reached adulthood. And at that point, the ones eating the hard diet had 30% less body fat than the ones eating the soft diet. Now, why is this? It's because digestion takes work. When we eat, our metabolic rate rises. We feel tired. We feel sometimes hot. Our guts are working hard. They're doing all sorts of things. They're making acid. They're making enzymes. They're preparing for uh, the absorption. They're actually using muscular energy. And the amount of energy that you use depends on how soft the food is. So here we have our two groups of rats again. And here's how much the metabolic rate rises after a meal, up to an hour here and 
just over an hour and a half here. And what you see is that the two groups have their metabolic rates rising together, and then it continues to rise more for the ones eating the harder diet. And that means more calories are being spent here. So even though they're eating the same amount and expending the same amount in locomotion, they are expending more in the process of digestion, and that means they end up being leaner than the ones eating the soft food. There's not much known about this in humans, but last year a study was published by actually an undergraduate in California together with her advisor, and they were able to measure the rise in metabolic rate following a meal in people who ate a relatively very processed meal of, um, of white bread and cheddar cheese compared to multigrain bread and a less processed cheese. And you see the same thing here. Eating the less processed food, then the metabolic rate rises higher, and they're saving 64 calories in the sandwich. You want to save 64 calories? It's an easier way to do it than going for a run. So it doesn't surprise me that when you look at what hunters and gatherers do, you find this sort of quote. Animal flesh is never eaten raw. When meat is so tender that the sinews will fall apart, then it's usually crushed in a mortar, cooking and processing. But in fact, at Harvard, we have done a study led by my student, Rachel Kalmoti, in which for the first time, we've assessed in a mammal the consequences of eating a food that has been eaten raw or cooked and unpounded versus mashed up. And what we found with these experiments is that cooking is overwhelmingly the most important thing. Here you see the relative body change when they're eating sweet potatoes that have been subject to various treatments, and these are the ones cooked, they're maintaining their weight nicely, and these are the ones eaten raw, and they are losing weight rapidly. And here you see the same sort of figure with meat, where you're feeding mice on meat, and the cooked ones are doing well, and the raw ones are doing much less well. So isn't this amazing? Everybody on Earth cooks their food, with the exception of some urban raw fooders. And yet, this is the first study published last year in which we have looked to see what is the effect of cooking on a mammal. So I think what it's doing is integrating the effects of the consequences of cooking that I mentioned, and probably some others as well. And what it suggests is enormously important, because the way that evolution works is that individuals are on a permanent search for energy, which they can turn into making babies. And even very small energy gains matter. In the chimpanzees that I study, what we find is that there are periods of the year when you have relatively more or relatively less ripe fruit in the environment. And if a female is waiting to get pregnant, when there is lots of ripe fruit available, she gets pregnant quicker. What this graph shows is that if she's able to raise the amount of ripe fruit in her diet from 60% to 80%, then she gets a big drop in how long she waits to conceive. Believe me, she's mating all this time. That's not the problem. 5% more ripe fruit in the diet, four months quicker to conceive. Four months quicker to have that baby that will carry her genes and mean that she is evolutionarily successful. We don't know what the total effect of cooking is on the number of calories in the food. We know that there are lots of different effects. They will probably add up together in all sorts of different ways. Is it 25% extra, 50%, 100%? We don't know. But I think it's absolutely clear that cooking increases the amount of energy we get out of our food. So that's my first little section. You'll be relieved to know that the others aren't going to be as long as that. <laughs> so the um, question about humans that we really began with is, can humans live on raw foods alone? Because it's perfectly obvious that every other animal can. You give wild chimpanzees their raw food diet, they do very well in producing their babies. What about humans? The only experimental evidence, if we call it that, comes from the urban raw foodists, the people who, living under the conditions I described earlier, are choosing for philosophical reasons, sometimes for health reasons, 
to eat their food raw. And here is the dramatic data that come from the only study of one of German, 500 German raw foodists that has investigated this. What they found is that as the percentage of food that a woman eats raw increases up to 100% all of her diet, then by that time her reproductive system tends to close down. 50% of the women completely amenorrheic. So they're not menstruating, and there was an additional maybe 20% of women who were subfecund, or uh, actually failure to uh, be fecund, uh, because of interferences that were slightly less than complete amenorrhea. So here you have human raw foodists living under these excellent conditions that we reviewed earlier, a very high class food that is still being processed to some extent, and yet the average woman is incapable of having a baby. I think that means something very simple. It means that humans are different from every other animal. Humans are adapted to cooked food. And then the question is, why? Well, at one level, I think the answer is pretty clear. Humans have got various physiological differences from our close relatives, and one of them is that we have, on the whole, very small guts. Here what we have is a plot of, in relationship to body size along here, the total volume of the gut. And what we see for the different primates is that there is a pretty good relationship between gut volume and body mass. And then here is the human point, lower off the curve than any other primate we have the smallest guts in relationship to body mass of any species. And similarly, we have the smallest teeth of any species, the smallest chewing teeth. And that makes sense because we have adapted to our relatively soft food. We don't need our big teeth for the tough raw foods that other species do. Now, there are all sorts of other ways waiting to be discovered and I think over the next decade or two, working out what metabolic differences there occur between humans and chimpanzees that might underlie our commitment to a cooked diet is going to be really fascinating and I think medically quite important. But for the moment, I feel very comfortable in concluding that humans are biologically adapted to eating cooked food, and then the question is, how long has this been going on? Well, for many years, what we have known is that the human genus, beginning back with Homo erectus 1.9 million years ago, is very different from the earlier ancestors because there is a narrow rib cage and a narrow pelvis compared to the broad pelvis and the broad flaring rib cage of Australopithecus. We don't know about this pattern in the species that came between Australopithecines and Homo erectus, the Habilines. But what this indicates is that there was a capacity to retain a large volume of gut in the Australopithecines, just as there is in the modern apes that share this pattern, the chimpanzees and gorillas and so on. So that is the time at which our guts appeared to become small, and there is no subsequent time in which we see any indication of a reduction in gut size. And then tooth size also dropped. It had its biggest drop about the same time uh, between the Habilines and Homo erectus. So tooth molar size in relationship to the size of the body becomes smaller then and stays actually um, around that size. It sort of wobbles a bit in this uh, period. But there are individuals even 100,000 years ago that had the same tooth size as Homo erectus and then there was a further fall later. So the big falls happened with Homo erectus, and that's why it seems to me that the, the logical conclusion is that we have been cooking since 1.9 million years ago, when our guts became smaller and our teeth became smaller in response to this kind of diet. And it's very difficult for me to understand how cooking could have come in later and not had an impact, because with its tremendous effect on the physical quality of the diet and the amount of calories you get out of it, it should have been anatomically recognizable. But nothing much happens, as Darwin, in a sense, noted. So there's the new concept that cooking 
uh, together with the increased meat in the diet, was responsible for making us human about 1.9 million years ago, and then uh, nothing much changed after that period. We got bigger brains uh, in a fairly continuous process. The major obstacle, of course, to this is the one I mentioned earlier. Uh, we'd love to know more about the fire, and I'm hoping that many of these sites in Africa, where people have said, you know, I think I've found evidence for the control of fire here, and other people have said, are you absolutely sure? And they say, well, I suppose there are other possibilities. I'm hoping that people will go back and really look at these very carefully. And I mentioned that one of these sites is being looked at carefully like that, Van der Werk and um, Francesco Berner from, from Boston University is, is uh, just about to publish in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences a paper saying that, yes, they're absolutely certain now that this was the result of uh, control of fire by humans, because it's a big cave and they just got a tremendous amount of evidence of burning right deep in it in a way that natural fire cannot explain. And here's the overall pattern for looking at the uh, presence of the archaeological evidence of control of fire. As you go back from you know, recent times, 35,000 years ago, back to 400,000, you see with uh, each of these eras a reduction in the number of sites that show evidence of fire. Well, there's all sorts of archaeological reasons why you can explain that in terms of the decay of the material or the loss of the caves. And I think what's going on here is that we're not seeing any kind of threshold effect. What we're seeing is just a decay because evidence of control of fire just tends to go away. I may be wrong, but the challenge of finding out exactly when humans did start using fire is a really exciting one that I hope will lead to some new conclusions within the next couple of decades. And if I'm wrong, then I'll be fascinated to find out why it was that our teeth and our gut did de uh, decline in size 1.9 million years ago, and why cooking didn't have any major effect subsequently. Well, I want to just um, uh, go to the question of, of why cooking matters. And I want to suggest two things. First of all, there's a practical aspect, and that is that the Atwater Convention needs to change. The Atwater Convention is the convention that we have used since over 100 years ago to assess the caloric value of our foods. And what it does is essentially to work out the number of carbohydrates, fats, and proteins in the food, and then give them a standard number and say, that's the number of calories you're going to get out of your food. What is ignored by the Atwater Convention completely is the effect of food processing. And that means that it ignores the fact that if food is less well processed, it is less well digested. And it ignores the fact that if food is less well processed, the costs of digestion are higher. This is potentially important for, at one extreme, people who try to design a healthy diet as a raw foodist based on the Atwater Convention values. Because if I think you used Atwater Convention values, you would probably die. And then your relatives would be justified in suing the USDA for giving false information. At a gentler level, it would seem important because if people are trying to lose weight, we should give them more information about the fact that food processing has had huge effects. It is not true what the data currently say, that the number of calories from raw food is the same as the number of calories cooked. Instead, what we see is that there is evidence for food processing seriously affecting the number of calories, reducing them. And if you think about the fact that our food has become increasingly highly processed over the last 100 years, it's increasingly finely ground. We increasingly toss out the fiber and eat our bread as soft white rather than multigrain. Then uh, that seems to be a reasonable uh, contributor to the obesity crisis. 
So I'm looking forward to a day when the Atwater Convention is modified in a way that recognizes the fact that food processing is having a big impact in increasing the number of calories that we, in practice, take across the gut wall. And then the other exciting thing from the point of view of the Leakey Foundation is that I think cooking, well, I think it made us human. I think that what happened 1.9 million years ago was that an ancestor discovered that if you had fire and you put your food in it, then it tasted nicer. We've done experiments with all of the great apes, and there are experiments with dogs and cats and mice and rats, and in every case, if you give them cooked food, they prefer it. They prefer it because they are pre-adapted to like the qualities of cooked food. The tastes, the flavors, and the physical nature of those foods all signal that this is going to be an easily digestible and very valuable food. So it would have been easy for an ancestor to learn quickly once they'd figured out about the fire. And then I think what happened was a rapid evolution in the direction of being able to get the maximum benefit out of using cooked food, and that would have included shedding those parts of the gut that you no longer needed to digest the fiber in plants. Getting a smaller gut, being more efficient in your digestion, having more babies, being able to live longer, having a better immune system to fight against disease, all the benefits that come from being able to have a higher quality of food. And out of that came all sorts of other things. Here's a rather cute one. Hunter-gatherers have babies at a rate about twice what the great apes do. And that is partly because they wean their babies young. How do they wean them? They put them onto what we cheerfully call solid food. This isn't solid food, the kind of pap that we feed our babies. This is mush. The babies are very happy to have it. So would the chimps be. But a solid food for a young chimp is leaves and tough fruits. So cooking enabled our babies to wean early. Then we have a high reproductive rate. Then we have big family size. Then we have helpers coming in to help with the family. All sorts of changes in that way. Here's a huge change. If we ate our food like a chimpanzee or an orangutan or a gorilla, we would be spending more than half our day, probably, chewing our food, just moving our mouths up and down. But in fact, you know, even though you might linger over your meal, the actual chewing time is less than an hour a day for humans. And that doesn't matter whether you're in America or in the South Seas or a hunter-gatherer. The humans have enormously reduced the total time we spend chewing, and that has incredible effects. It means, for example, that we can free our behavior to indulge in risky activities, like going hunting. But a chimpanzee, they don't spend much time hunting, because they've got serious business to do, which is to resume eating. So they'll try hunting for 10, 15, 20 minutes at a time, and then they give up. But humans can go hunting for hours, six, seven, eight hours at a time, knowing that they can eat all the food they need in less than an hour when they get home. One of the fascinating stories that's been coming out of primatology recently is the notion that you can understand variation in the size of the species' brains partly by how costly they are. Brains are very costly. In the human case, more than a fifth of the food we eat goes to fuel our brains. Every fifth hamburger and more is just used to give glucose to the brain. Big brains are expensive. They're expensive for other primates too. And the only way that primates can afford them is if they have some other organ that they're not spending a lot of calories on. And in primates, you find that the species that happen to have high quality diets, more fruit than leaves, say, have smaller guts. And the ones that have smaller guts are able to use the energy spared from having those guts into feeding their brains. So in primates, smaller guts lead to big brains. Humans have the smallest guts of all. We have the biggest brains of all. It seems as though that would be a major contributor to enabling us to fuel that organ. And then there's an extraordinary thing about cooking, which is that if you look at all of the societies around the world, 
that practice cooking in the um, traditional cultural ways, you find that invariably it is the women who do the cooking for men. And one of the consequences of this is that men have their time free to do the kinds of things I was talking about, hunting or important things like sitting under a bush talking to other men <laughs> or going to war. Uh, women, on the other hand, uh, the time that is saved by not chewing all day is largely replaced by processing the food and cooking. I'm not sure if um, the dark view that this is a, a system imposed on women by men uh, is going to be very easy to test, but uh, certainly you can't have a sexual division of labor, I don't think, until you have a system of cooking. And it's easy to imagine that out of the system of cooking arose a system in which men were able to take advantage of it and get the woman to cook for them. There's lots of questions still to ask about cooking, but I do think that we are on the point now where we can look at humans like other animals. And just as other species can be, have much of their biology explained in terms of their diet, so I think it's true that humans are the ape that learned to cook. So Virginia Woolf had this nice quotation used to remind us about the joys of cooking. Uh, you can't think well, love well, sleep well, if you haven't dined well. Cooking is at the heart of so much of what makes us human. But for me, the ultimate reason for celebrating cooking is that without it, we would still be apes. <laughs> Thank you very much. There are five recognizable individuals in this picture by David Bygott. There's uh, Charles Darwin. Many of these are leaky grantees in a way, I suppose. There's Jane Goodall. There's Richard Dawkins. There's Stephen Jay Gould and Hugh. Maybe we can bring the house lights up a little bit so we can hear the questions better. And then let's uh, open it up to all kinds of questions for our speaker. It was a wonderful lecture. Thank you. Yes, sir. Question was Can you comment on the Inuit diet? And the follow-up was that it was um, largely animal and largely uncooked. So um, I'll agree with the Inuit diet, the uh, Inuits and Eskimos, uh, having a diet that is largely animal. It's extraordinary. They are 99% um, eating um, mammals and fish, um, and uh, they tend to be very fatty species. But I will quarrel with the idea that it is uh, largely raw. I did a lot of research into the diets of those Arctic peoples, and um, I relied heavily on uh, people that were writing around the, the turn of the uh, 20th century, at the end of the 1800s and the early 1900s. And then there was the explorer Vijamur Stefansson, uh, who lived as an Eskimo uh, himself. He, he married a, an Inuit woman. And um, the story that I got out of that is that the reputation that the uh, Arctic peoples have for eating their food raw comes from the fact that during the day, they very often do indeed eat raw food. So here's the story. Uh, they go hunting, and they may go hunting all day. It is very difficult to start a fire out on the ice. Uh, even starting a fire in the igloo is very difficult, or at least to say uh, cooking is very difficult because they're cooking on seal oil, and it's a relatively cool flame, so that a wife has to start cooking very early in the afternoon to have the food decently cooked by the time the evening rolls around and the hunter comes back. Out on the ice floes, out in, uh, in the, the wild, uh, it's essentially impossible. There's very little fuel, 
And so what they do is they cache bits of um, meat, uh, caribou guts or um, uh, seals or uh, very often fish, and they do indeed uh, dig that up and eat it raw. But when they come home, they absolutely expect to have the main meal of the day, which is the evening meal, fully cooked. And uh, Stefansson was very clear that a wife who has not got a properly cooked meal at the end of the day uh, is going to be in big trouble and actually then starts talking about domestic violence. And, uh, and he makes a point of saying that they do not like their meat bloody. They like their steaks cooked better than anybody in New York. Question way on the top. Did cooking spread by diffusion or was it discovered in different places independently? Well, we need that time machine. Um, if, you, if you follow my logic and you think that uh, cooking began 1.9 million years ago, then I can't see any very easy way to answer your question. But I do think that whenever cooking was first adopted, it would have spread uh, extremely fast because it is so enormously important. I think of, of life as basically a search for energy. All species are on the search for energy to convert into more of their own species. And if cooking has uh, anything like the caloric gains that we see it having today, then the evolutionary advantages would have been just very big. Now, something that's very odd that's come out in the last few years is that in the period between 1.9 and 1.5 million years ago, you seem to have in East Africa both uh, hominids of the Homo erectus type and hominids of the habiline type, the Homo australopithecus habilis type. Now, if that's right, and it certainly seems to be, it suggests that you've got uh, a species that was eating cooked food, I think, in the case of Erectus, and raw food, in the case of the Havilines, living not far away from each other. So, to me, that suggests that even if the tendency to cook would spread very quickly among one lineage, it wasn't very easily picked up by another lineage. Maybe the other lineage started out being, I don't know, the other side of uh, Lake Turkana for a few tens of thousands of years. And then by the time they met, uh, there was so little communication between them that uh, um, the Habilines didn't see what the, uh, the newly erectus species were doing. It, one can easily get into speculative fantasy all too quickly. So the short answer is, I have no idea, but it's fun to think about. <laughs> yes, sir. So with our cooking today, uh, vegetables, we still have the issue of obesity. And what about people in the past, perhaps not cooking as well? The, the vegetables. So that's a great question about um, the, the multiple effects of cooking. When we cook our vegetables, as when we cook most things, there is a strong tendency for a loss of vitamins. Uh, the average vitamin probably falls in concentration by 50%, that sort of thing. You've got a few cases, uh, such as uh, the ones in uh, tomatoes, uh, where they actually uh, have a rise in concentration with cooking. But mostly, you lose vitamins from cooking. And as the questioner said, uh, you think of this as a loss of nutrition. Now, I've been focusing totally on one aspect of nutrition, and that is calories. And the reason I do that is because if you study wild animals, and if you think about hunters and gatherers, then calories are what really matters. And I think that's for two reasons. One is that they are so important and so difficult to get. And the other is that vitamins are relatively unimportant in the wild because with the diversity of foods that people tend to eat, 
they almost always get enough vitamins. I don't think we have a single case of a study of primates in which there is a shortage of vitamins in their natural diets. It's when you get into agricultural foods and you start eating 90% of your diet is cassava or something that there is a risk of getting a vitamin shortage of one kind or another uh, or in that particular case a protein shortage. So uh, as we think about the effects of cooking vegetables nowadays don't worry about it from the point of view of the calories because or you, maybe you should worry about it, it depends what you want but anyway the more you cook your vegetables the more calories you will get out of them but it's true you'll get fewer vitamins so if you have the kind of diet which makes you susceptible to low vitamins you know, too much time spent in McDonald's or wherever, then, uh, then cooking does matter. Uh, so probably everyone heard that the question is, um, have I faced negative uh, feedback from people battling the concepts? Well, there are certainly people who disagree with me. Um, there was a, a, a raw foodist who, who wrote to me uh, with a very hostile um, review. Um, I tried to point out that um, I got nothing against raw foodists. I got some good friends who are raw foodists. Uh, I, I think raw foodism is uh, absolutely splendid if what you want to do is to lose weight or if you want to just live in a, um, that particular uh, lifestyle. So I personally have you know, no moral problem with it at all, but he seemed to think I did. Um, I think uh, the more interesting kinds of uh, debates and discussions are uh, within the, the scholarly area. And um, there are certainly archaeologists who find it really difficult to accept the notion that we could have been using fire for uh, almost two million years without leaving much more evidence of it. Uh, my friend uh, Will Robrooks in Holland, uh, he calls the relationship between himself and myself science friction. <laughs> and uh, one hopes that there'll be more heat than light, but um, I, I wouldn't say there's any you know, very strong controversies compared to other things that I've written. Boy, now trying to uh, condense that in five words or less. This has to do with uh, the diet and the size of molars and incisors in humans versus uh, non-human primates and combine that or compare that against the length of our intestines. Is that more or less right? I mean, the, the, the gist of your question? The made was that within the primates, humans had smaller teeth and shorter intestines. Yet when we compare humans with herbivores and carnivores, size of the incisors and the length of the intestines seems to be more consistent with herbivores rather than carnivores for non-primate animals. Um, so uh, let's see, the, the question is about um, uh, human teeth and what they're adapted to do and uh, part of the question is are we more like a carnivore or a herbivore and then are we really like either because our teeth are, are small? And I think part of the problem with the way that anthropology has thought about the evolution of the human diet is that we have tried to put human adaptations into 
too small a box. And the box is what other primates do. So we have tried to make us just like other primates, but just a little bit extrapolated further along. We're not like other primates. If you look at the teeth of our ancestors, then they clearly are on the herbivorous side because of the uh, relatively blunt teeth and the big chewing teeth compared to the, the sharp scissor-like teeth of, of carnivores. But if you look at the fact that our teeth are small, then that doesn't fit particularly with our being herbivores that are needing to chew a lot. Well, I've given my explanation for why this should be. Other people have preferred the notion that we look like carnivores, but our teeth look nothing like those of carnivores. So I think we need to just expand our concept of the possible. And once we start imagining that we are biologically adapted to this cultural process of processing our food, then it's legitimate to be able to say we're simply different from other animals. All right, and maybe two more questions. I see one hand there and one there. Let's start with this gentleman. The question was, did you say chimpanzees like cooked food? Is there a <laughs> and the question following that was, have you tried to teach chimpanzees to cook or just get used to cooking cooked food? Was that it? Well, thank you. Yes, I did mention that chimpanzees do like their food cooked. We've tested this formally by uh, enabling them to, to taste bits of, uh, of potato, for instance, or apple or, or beef uh, that were raw or cooked, and then uh, offering them like this in front of a cage and then seeing uh, which they came to. And, and uh, chimpanzees, orangutans, gorillas, uh, bonobos, they all preferred their food cooked. So it's a great question. Uh, you know, what would it take to get a chimpanzee to cook its own food? Uh, there's a, a bonobo, uh, Kanzi, uh, who is um, working with Sue Savage Rumba and understands a lot of communications through uh, using icons on a board uh, and also through understanding uh, English, spoken English, uh, when Sue speaks. And she goes into the woods with him and um, uh, saying things like, uh, uh, please will you go and collect some sticks together and please will you light the... Uh, a match and uh, set them on fire, and please will you go and get some sausages and put them in the frying pan and cook? He does it. Yet there's not much evidence of spontaneous cooking, but um, I, let's see, what am I allowed to say? I've got some colleagues who will shortly be publishing a paper that you will find very interesting about the notion that chimpanzees uh, would like to actually have their food cooked. One more question. That was a very timely question, then. <laughs> the last one? So the question is, uh, Please comment on the evolution in the animal, in the plant world, and in the animal world, and how they go together. That's quite an encompassing question. Yeah. Could you specify the question a little bit more? Oh, I see, a sort of co-evolutionary relationship with the increase in the quality of the food supply in the plants. Yeah, that's a really interesting um, uh, idea. Um, primates, of course, the order to which we belong, that have been living on this earth for 65 and maybe longer million years, are very much fruit eaters. And uh, the fruits that primates eat are co-adapted uh, with the primates because uh, the primates scatter the seeds and uh, so the plant benefits by having their seeds scattered and put into places where they can grow 
and uh, the plants offer rich nutrients in the fruits. And you're thinking of, of on a macro scale that um, foods have become higher quality over evolutionary time. And I think you're right. I mean, the grasses that evolved uh, during the last 30, 40 million years, uh, but particularly more recently, have produced starch-rich seeds that um, are uh, extraordinarily nutritious. And of course, the story of, of human evolution recently, uh, particularly with agriculture, has been very much dependent on those foods. So it, it's interesting to think that um, if, if humans had somehow come along, what, uh, 200 million years ago in the time of the dinosaurs, uh, the foods that they would have been finding to eat in the natural world might not have been quite so nutritious. I hadn't really quite thought of that, but uh, that, that's a great idea. Thank you so much. Before we all say goodbye and go upstairs and um, take advantage of the author being here and having a book signed, I would like to also point out that later in the fall, we will be honored by another speaker from the Leakey Foundation. Uh, unusual, but there's a good reason. We were just, you just mentioned dinosaurs. As you know, the museum is expanding. There is a new wing just about ready for our exhibits people to start working in. And one of the first permanent exhibits to open will be later this year. Um, in a few months, and the story there will be, it's Texas, so it's quite large, it's the story of life, anything before dinosaurs, dinosaurs, and after dinosaurs, and part of that after the dinosaur component will deal with human evolution, hence we will have another speaker, as wonderful, wonderful as our speaker tonight, so stay tuned for more information about that later in the year. And having said all that, thank you very much for coming, and let's go upstairs and take advantage of our speaker's presence and have a book signed. Thank you so much.